Good morning, Avalon Beach Church. Welcome. Another glorious day in God's best sanctuary. We're so thankful that you're here. I'm particularly excited about today. My son, Zach, is leading us in worship. He started a beach church for our first three or four years, I think. And it's so awesome to have him back from Vermont for this week and next week. We've got a friend, Brian, joining us on guitar and the Hexen family here as well. We are so blessed. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you pray with me? Let's go to the Lord. Jesus, we are so thankful that this is in your heart. I believe that with all of my heart. You ordained this for us. You're sovereign. You care. And you love when your children worship. So, Lord, we come here today asking that the presence and power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ would rule and reign in every heart today. Lord, we're asking that someone might come to faith in Jesus today. Today would be the day of their salvation. But Lord, our theme for this summer is Miracle on 30th Street. We're asking for the signs and wonders of your kingdom to come here today on earth just as it is in heaven. So Lord, we invite you, we welcome you, we trust you, we love you. And Lord, we're also here to offer this praise to you. And we, we believe that it will bring joy to your heart as we worship you. So come and inhabit the praises of your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, God's people said. Would you welcome Zach and the team?
it's hard for me to sing that song without talking about this because it's just so, I think it's important for us to, to realize when we sing about the earth being so looking for it, I love how this song, that song frames what that is. Because I think for a long time I thought it was just kind of ambiguous. I'd probably even say it was like almost like that smoke that was going to cover the earth, you know, like someday in the future when the Lord returns, some, something I couldn't really define. The, the, the earth being filled with his glory is us rising up, yeah. singing holy and joy for heaven. Yeah, We're doing it right now. We're filling the earth with his glory as we sing. There's nothing better than that. We get to participate in heaven. I'm such a one It couldn't fill me And that be praise The
Let's sing that chorus one more time. Our theme is Miracle on 30th Street. Listen, the Spirit's already at work. I believe that with all my heart. Whatever your need is, go ahead and just bring that to Jesus right now. And as we sing, let the Spirit minister deeply to your soul. Let's sing that chorus again. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my I just want to take a minute and be ready to sing that one more time. Lord, I believe there's someone here that's struggling with a diagnosis. And Lord Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring healing to their bodies. We're, we believe someone here today might be struggling with a son or a daughter that needs to come home. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would draw that son or daughter back into your arms, Jesus. Lord, I believe someone here is struggling with sleeplessness. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to their spirit, to their soul, even in the night, Lord Jesus, that they would find rest. We declare over that person that Jesus said, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, Holy Spirit. Come even as we sing. By
And so it was just fun to buy things that I think would be fun and then hope that they would. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. When Zachary was 16 months old, I uh, had to convince my wife that we had to buy one of those indoor little basketball hoops. It had a backboard that said dunk it, a uh, big orange rim and an orange ball. And she said, he's too young for that. Well, I knew that, but I needed that. Uh, you got to picture the apartment that we lived in in Wilmore, Kentucky. I was uh, just starting seminary that year, Christmas uh, 1985, I guess. And I bought that thing for Zachary. He opened it up. I set it up immediately. We were in an apartment that was the front door. You walked in the front door. You were in the living room. No door. You just walked through an opening there, a wide opening. You were in the bedroom. No door. You walked through another opening. You were in the kitchen. Fortunately, there was a door uh, at the other end of the kitchen because that was the bathroom. If we didn't have that door, you'd be able to see it from the front door. So that's what our apartment looked like, which made a tremendous basketball court. And I would set that basketball thing up at the front door, and I could make it from almost anywhere in the apartment. I got really good at that uh, basketball. Zachary, not so much. I mean, he was 16 months old. Um, and it was, it was frustrating for him because he tried to do it. He just couldn't do it. So we developed what I called the power move. And Zachary would get the ball way back at the bathroom, and I would be sitting on my knees in front of the basketball hoop with it right behind me. And I would say, let Zach, let's do the power move. And he'd get that ball and run to the bathroom. And then I'd start the countdown, five. And boy, he started walking at eight months, so he was already running. And he started running from the bathroom with that ball. I'd get to four, he was already out of the kitchen. Three, he was midway through the bedroom. Two, he was already in the living room. When I got to one, he was leaping into the air into my arms. I would raise him up over my head, and he would dunk. I guess this fun. What's this do? And we do that power move over and over and over again. Five, four, three, two, one, slam! It was off. All right, you're trying to figure out how that's going to work into the message? We'll see. Peter, listen, I'm going to say this. Act like you're brand new to the Bible. Peter walked on the water. Peter did. If there's anybody in the New Testament that's like us, it's him, right? Peter walked on the water. Unbelievable. Listen to the Word of God. This is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through verse, through verse 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, most people believe, chronologically, this is right after the feeding of the 5,000. If you remember when we dealt with that miracle, it's very likely that ha that happened right after John the Baptist was beheaded. So these are trying times for Jesus. And he knows what's coming for all those people that he loves so deeply. It's already happened to John. And, it, and martyrdom will eventually come to every one of his disciples except John, who was exiled on an island when he was older. Jesus dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now, we're very quickly to think this is a story about Peter sinking. But just stop there for a minute. Peter walked on the water. Verse 30. 
When we saw the wind, we were afraid, and beginning to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You are little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Amen? What a great story. I love to think about all the dynamics of this story. There's all kinds of human emotion involved in this story. And first, I want to draw, I think I'm going to make six points, so stay with me here. The first point that I want to make is the very beginning. It's very interesting to me that Jesus needed time alone. Again, I think we kind of picture Jesus with a big red S under his white robe. But remember, he's fully God, yes, but he's also fully man. He's fully God and fully, 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 fully man. And this is a time, I believe with all my heart, that is just, man, it's emotional for him. And what I want you to get is that he needed time with his father. He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. He needed that. And, and this is going to be important at the end of the message as well. But I want to just to remind you, in his full humanity, I want you to remember how that happened. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that before he descended to earth in Bethlehem, Philippians 2 said that he emptied himself of what was rightfully his. He emptied himself of what was rightfully his. Fully God, but fully man. And somehow this is a bit of a mystery, but man, I'm, I'm grasping at least a little of it. What that means to me is this. While he was on this earth, he had to rely on the Godhead exactly in the same way that he anticipates that you and I will rely on the Godhead. And that meant that he needed communion, union, time spent with his father. And it would also mean, and I'll come back to this at the end of the message, that he relied on the Holy Spirit in the same way that he anticipates that we would rely on the Holy Spirit. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Jesus needed time with the Father. Man, if any of us think that we can make it through this crazy life that we're living in such a crazy, horrendous time, as the time we're living. If we can somehow do that without discipline, time with the Father, we are crazy. The Son needed it. And so I'm just pleading with you to make sure you work into your life with Jesus time spent in prayer. That's what Jesus is doing. This is another thing that I find crazy about this story. He tells the disciples to go off in the boat, across the lake, and says, don't worry, I'll catch up with you. And they do it. It's like no, not one of them said, what do you mean you'll catch up with us? I don't know where are you going to do that. We're getting in a boat and crossing the lake. He says, yeah, I'll catch up with you. But they did it. Awesome. The second thing that I want you to remember about this story is that the disciples find themselves in the midst of what is a brewing storm. And especially Peter and the other fishermen that were a part of Jesus' band. They understood what could happen on that Sea of Galilee. One commentator writes that when a storm descended, it was su in such a place regarding a low sea level, that when a storm came, it could become a huge, this is what the commentator said, a huge boiling cauldron. Peter had seen bodies wash up from storms on the Sea of Galilee, no doubt. And so they're beginning to get concerned, but the storm fear is not the greatest fear of that night, right? This is a bad night for them. Because in the midst of the wind blowing and the waves rising, they see what they think is a ghost. And the Bible says that they cried out. These are rough, rugged, fisherman-type guys, crying out probably like schoolgirls. I mean, just a, there's a ghost out there. Lots of fear in the story. 
The third thing is the best. I love this. Jesus said to them, hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. And then the Peter's response is the best. He says, Lord, if it's you. You see, you can't be too careful with the steady joker walking on the water in the middle of the night. And he's not going to do anything for just anybody. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. Unbelievable. Peter walks on the water. Just let that rest. Don't jump too fast to the fact that he takes his eyes off Jesus, looks at the waves, and sinks down. He walks on the water. Now, for the longest time in my life, I saw this as one of the best stories of faith that there is in the Bible. But I started to question that, oh, it's probably been about 10 years ago now. Because I, I mean, I do believe there was tremendous faith, but I also think this could have played in. The wind's blowing and the waves are crashing, and Peter, more than anybody else on that boat, knows what's possible. And he looks at the scene that's taking place. In his mind, this boat could be going down. And Jesus is staying up. So where would you go? And I go to Jesus. It's probably, it probably is just tremendous faith. But there may have been just a little bit of pragmatism in there, too. The boat's going down. Jesus is staying up. I'm going where he is. Whatever he's got, I want. Because that's where the safety is. Peter walks on the water. Now, we do know, and this is why we love Peter, because we relate to him so much. He only walks on the water for so long before he starts looking around and going, Whoa, what am I doing? The wind blows strong. Waves start to rise. He's not anymore looking at Jesus, but he's looking at his circumstances, right? That's an important part of this story. He's no longer looking at Jesus. He's looking at his circumstances. That's where we get into trouble. When things are blowing hard against us and waves are crashing against us. He takes his eyes off Jesus. He looks at his circumstances, and immediately he starts to think. Now, fortunately, and he knows, he knows what to do, and that is with great humility, cry out from his gut, Jesus, save me! And this is what Jesus has come to do. It's what he'll do for you today. If you find yourself sinking down in the midst of really tough, hard, scary circumstances. You get your eyes back on him and cry out with humility. Jesus, save me. He will. That's what he's come to do. It's who he is. And so sure enough, man, just before Peter goes down under, Jesus reaches out his hand and pulls him back up. And Jesus saves him. Now, the way this ends is the way miracles should end. It's really at the heart of why we experience miracles. Remember Jesus saying before the miracle a couple of weeks ago, so that you'd understand the glory of God. So that you'd know who God is. And then Jesus performs the miraculous. That's how this miracle ends as well. When they all finally get back in the boat, pick up their jaws, from what they had just seen. Looking at Jesus, knowing through this miracle even greater who he is, they begin to worship him. I love what Zach said about the glory of God covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's rising up, and when that happens, it's because those of us who love him are looking at him knowing who he is and bringing glory to the name of Jesus. That's what we get to do on this side of the day of the Lord. We get to look at Jesus. We spend time with the Father. We gaze into the eyes of Jesus because he's right here right now. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit and we bring glory to the name of God. That's what we get to do. That's our role. 
Westminster Catechism answers the question, what is the chief end of man, mankind, humankind? What is the chief end, the ultimate purpose? To love God and enjoy Him forever. That's what we do. Now, here's what I want you to see about this miracle. Jesus emptied himself of what was rightfully his. I believe with all my heart that that's one of the key things to understand about Jesus and then how we function on this planet. Jesus emptied himself of what was rightfully his, so he needed to spend time with the Father in disciplined prayer, and he appropriated the power of the Holy Spirit because he wanted to be the perfect example. He wanted to identify fully with us, not only in our sins, but how, and this is what's so important, but how we should function in ministry. He emptied himself of what, what was rightfully his, and then throughout his ministry, he modeled for us how we should, and we should ultimately live our lives in ministry. And so these miracles are through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus believed. You know how, why I believe this? Ten words in the Gospel of John. John, chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus, looking at his disciples, he says this, John 20, 21. Ten of the most important words in the Bible. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. In the same way that the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And so we empty ourselves in salvation of pride, being the captain of our own soul. We submit to his authority, his power. And then as we minister and walk the rest of our lives as believers in Jesus, we spend time with the Father in prayer, and we appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I think the church, by and large, has lost this truth. But in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus says very, very, very clearly that through the power of the Holy Spirit, if you appropriate that, you, disciples of mine, followers of mine, lovers of mine, you will do greater things. That's our role in the church today, to believe. John 6, the work of God is this, to believe. And in the same way that Jesus did, we spend time with the Father, we appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit, and we believe for miraculous signs and wonders. And the promise is that we would do even greater things. Now, most, most commentaries say, ah, oh, what that really means is in quantity. There'll be more because there's more of us. So they kind of put a wet blanket on the idea that we should believe for miraculous. The power of God walking on water. You would do even greater things. I believe with all my heart that we are only scratching the surface of what Jesus longs to do in the midst of his church. And that we can believe for more and more and more. We spend time with the Father in prayer. We appropriate the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And we believe. Today, this is what I'm asking us to do. Believe God for the fullness of his Holy Spirit. One of the heart cries that I have in ministry is first that people would get saved. But then you know what? I'm, I'm believing with all my heart that there will be a growing band of us who believe for the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. Have you been filled? It's not a request. It's not an option for some higher class living that some people can have. Paul says so clearly, in his letters to the church, be filled. And that's a continual command. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this is my heart cry this morning. First, and if you, are, if you aren't in a relationship with Jesus, 
that today is the day of salvation to you with all my heart. Uh, Phil, Eric, Zach, we'd love to pray with you at the end of this service that you would know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But we'd also like to pray with you that you would be being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to share one of the great testimonies that we have in the church. And it's by the great preacher, Charles Finch. Listen to his description of what it was like when he, a pastor, preacher, one of the greatest the church has ever known, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Finney writes, the Holy Spirit descended upon me in a manner that seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves and waves of liquid love. I love that. It seemed like the very breath of God. I wept aloud with joy and love, and I do not know what I should say. I literally bellowed out the unutterable gushing of my heart. These waves came over me and over me and over me, one after the other, until I recollect I cried out, I shall die if these waves continue to pass over me. I said, Lord, I cannot bear any more. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? And again, stand with me. I'm going to bring this down for a landing. Are you ready? If you are not in a relationship with Jesus, would you let any hindrance just go? and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He'll wash away all your sins. He'll put His Spirit in your heart. Jesus will come to you now from the inside out. But also, and are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? Today you could do that. I'm going to pray in just a moment. We'd like to pray with you after the service. If you'd like to receive prayer from us, please feel free to come. And this is how I want to close. Five. Would you run towards him? The Father? Four. He's waiting with open arms. Three. He's got a power move for you. Two. It'll take a leap of faith. But you can do that. One, Jesus has a power move for every one of you. It's the infilling of his Holy Spirit for those who love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today is so strategic, I believe, in your mind. You've ordained this day. You've created it. It's in your heart. I'm trusting, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation for some woman, some man, maybe a child, a teenager. But, Lord, I'm also just believing that many of us today would be being filled. And so, Lord, I, would you come right now? For those that aren't in relationship with you, would you receive their repentance? of sin, and would you put your spirit inside of them? And Lord, for those of us that do believe, Lord, we want our eyes on you today, not on our circumstances. And Lord, even if we're sinking, we know where to cry, and we cry to you today, Lord, save me. And Lord, we're asking that just as the Father sent you, Jesus, you would send us into a world committed to time with God, appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, men, women, kings, kids, in the name of Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that we have that ocean behind us. 
and thank you for putting the testimony. I'm asking for waves and waves and waves of liquid love. And I pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Bless you. Have a wonderful week. Come and receive prayer if you're willing. We'd love to pray with you.